In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite Mr. Thor Venisland, Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, to participate in this meeting. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of Agenda of Item 2. I now give the floor to Mr. Tor Venistant. of the Security Council. Over three months have passed since the deadly escalation between Israel and militants in Gaza, and the situation remains tense. In response, the UN continues to engage with all sides to maintain calm and provide urgent assistance to the Gaza's residents. On 19 August, the state of Qatar announced the contribution of 40 million US dollars over four months to the UN, UN to provide cash assistance to some 100,000 needy families in Gaza. I welcome Qatar's contribution to support vulnerable families, which comes in addition to the already 10 million US dollars per month that Qatar gives to provide the UNOPS program of supporting fuel to the Gaza power plant. These two efforts combined are vital to improving the dire socio-economic and humanitarian situation on the Strip. This support came following the UN humanitarian appeal in May and its call at the HLC technical meeting in July to the international community to work with the Palestinian Authority and the UN on implementing a robust program of humanitarian aid and recovery for the Gaza Strip, developed in full contact with the PA. As the UN is about to implement uh, this program of cash assistance to the needy family, I wish to thank the government of Qatar for its general support to these programs and the PA for its support for them. In addition, some 45 million of the requested 95 million dollars has been raised for the UN humanitarian flash appeal. A nearly additional US dollars 55 million has been mobilized in support of humanitarian response more broadly. I again thank donors for their general support while reiterating that further contributions are urgently needed. Mr. President, Concerning level of violence continued throughout the occupied Palestinian territory during the reporting period. In Gaza, militants launched incendiary balloons on multiple occasions and one rocket towards Israel. The rocket was intercepted, causing no damage, while the balloons caused several fires in areas around the Strip. In retaliation, Israeli defense forces fired some 37 missiles against Hamas targets, resulting in damage but no injuries. Tension along the Gaza perimeter reached the peak on the 21st of August when hundreds of Palestinians attended a rally organized by Palestinian factions. During the demonstration, hundreds of people approached the security fence through stones and reportedly IEDs towards Israeli security personnel. Israeli forces fired on Palestinian protesters, injuring 51 Palestinians, including 25 children, the vast majority due to live ammunition. One Palestinian man and a 12-year-old Palestinian boy subsequently died of their wounds. One Israeli soldier was shot by a Palestinian and later died of, in of injuries. That evening, Israel launched six retaliatory airstrikes against what he said were Hamas military sites in Gaza. Another demonstration near the security fence east of Khan Yunis on 25 August led to another clash between Palestinians and ISF. Fourteen Palestinians were injured, including five by live ammunition. I reiterate that children must never be targeted nor put in harm's way and call on all sides to show restraint, avoid provocations at the fence, and keep the protest peaceful. In the occupied West Bank, clashes, attacks, search and arrest operations, including in Area A, and other incidents resulted in the death of nine Palestinians, including two children, 
and injuries to over 200, 280 Palestinians, including with live ammunition, and the vast majority with rubber bullets. One Israeli security personnel was injured during these events. Near daily clashes near Beta village in the northern West Bank took place in the context of protests against the nearby outpost of Eviatar, which is held by ISF after settlers evacuated the location on July. In over 100 days of protests, seven Palestinians have been killed and 972 injured by ISF, with one killed and 226 injured during the reporting period. On 27 July, a Palestinian man was shot dead by ISF near Beta. According to ISF, the man advanced towards the Israeli soldiers holding a suspicious object and ignored warning shots. The man reportedly, a water technician, was seen on video with a pipe wrench near a water pump shortly before he was shot. Israeli authorities said they had opened an investigation. On 6 August, another Palestinian was killed by ISF live fire in Beta during clashes with ISF. On 28 July, an 11-year-old Palestinian boy was killed in Beit Umar after ISF fired at the car he was traveling in with his father and siblings. Israeli authorities have opened an investigation. The next day, ISF killed a 20-year-old Palestinian man amid clashes during the boy's funeral. <clears throat> On 3 August, six Palestinians were injured during the exchange of fire with ISF in the Jenin refugee camp in Area A of the West Bank, including a 25-year-old man who later succumbed to his wounds. On 16 August, four Palestinians were killed and another injured by live ammunition in an exchange of fire with ISF during the Israeli search uh, operation in the camp. <clears throat> On 24 August, Israeli forces killed a 15-year-old boy with live ammunition during an arrest operation in Balata refugee camp in Nablus. According to Israeli officials, the boy had been threatened to throw a large object at ISF personnel. However, witnesses dispute the account and say the boy was shot in the head by ISF personnel some, by some distance. During the reporting period, six Palestinians, including one woman and one child, were injured in five violent incidences involving Israeli settlers. Palestinians penetrated attacks, perpetrated attacks against Israeli settlers and other civilians that resulted in five injuries and damage to property. <clears throat> On August 17, a 15-year-old Palestinian boy was attacked in the northern West Bank during which a group of Israeli settlers kidnapped the boy, tied him to a tree and brutally assaulted, cut and burned him. The boy who was conscious was eventually handed over to the Palestinian ambulance. I am deeply concerned by this hideous act and I expect the Israeli authorities to undertake a swift, thorough and transparent investigation and ensure that the perpetrators are held accountable. I am concerned by the continued tragic loss of life and serious injuries in the occupied Palestinian territory. I note that settler violence against Palestinian civilians is recurrent in my reporting to the Council. Further measures must be taken to ensure that Israel fulfills its obligation to protect Palestinian civilians from violence, including by Israeli settlers, and to investigate and hound accountable those responsible for such attacks. I reiterate that security forces must exercise maximum restraint and use of lethal force only when it's strictly unavoidable in order to protect lives. Mr. President, in a concerning incident on 14 August during the protest in Beta, Palestinians set fire to Star of David containing the image of a swastika. Such display of anti-Semitism is unacceptable. 
I urge all parties to refrain from incitements and provocative actions. Mr. President, during the reporting period, Palestinian civil society organizations and human rights defenders continue to face restrictions on their freedoms of expression, assembly and association. On 29 July, ISF reportedly conducted search of offices of the Bissan Center of Research and Development and of Defense for the Children International Palestine in Ramallah and confiscated equipment. On the 21st of August, Palestinian security forces arrested 23 people in Ramallah for their participation in planned demonstration, the majority of them before the protest started. Several of those arrested were well-known human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists and political activists. All the detained were subsequently released. I call on Israel to take all necessary measures to protect the right to freedom of associations and ensure that human rights organizations in the occupied Palestinian territory are protected from arbitrary actions. I also urge the Palestinian Authority to immediately stop arrest of human rights defenders, journalists and activists on charges that impinge upon exercise of freedom of expression. Mr. President, Israeli demolitions and confiscation of Palestinian homes and other structures continue throughout the reporting period. Overall, Israeli authorities demolished, seized and forced owners to demolish 81 Palestinian-owned structures in Area C, 22 in East Jerusalem, displacing 165 Palestinians, including 33 women and 98 children. The demolitions were carried out due to the lack of Israeli issued building permits, which are nearly impossible, impossible for Palestinians to obtain. On the 4th of August, 17 structures were seized in the Bedouin community of Ipsik in the Jordan Valley, displacing 27 people, including 19 children. The confiscation was carried out uh, due to com communities' location in an Israeli declared firing zone. On the 2nd of August, Israeli Supreme Court held a hearing to consider an appeal request by four Palestinian families facing eviction in the Sheikh Shuran neighborhood of East Jerusalem. The judges proposed a compromise which was not agreed and the hearing was adjourned with no date to reconvene. On 15 August, the Supreme Court postponed the eviction of several of the Palestinian families living in the same area of Sheikh Shuran, pending a decision of their request to appeal the decision to evict them. On 11 August, the Jerusalem Local Affairs Court froze the demolition of several dozen structures in the Al-Bustan section of the Silvan neighborhood up until 10 February 2022, pending planning discussions that are underway. I urge Israel to cease demolition and seizure of Palestinian property throughout the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem, in line with its obligation under international humanitarian law. Mr. President, returning to the situation in Gaza, I note a gradual and partial easing of the access restrictions by the Israeli authorities. On 29 July, the fishing zone was again expanded to 12 nautical miles after being restricted for four days in response to the launching of incendiary balloons into Israel from the Strip. On 13 and 26 August, Israeli authorities announced additional easing of import and export restriction. For the first time in 18 months, permits will be given to 2,000 Palestinian traders and 350 business people to cross from Gaza into Israel. While some 6,000 trucks, including the construction material, food and non-food items and fuel, entered Gaza through Karen Shalom, the volume of trade still remains below pre-escalation levels. On August 23, for the first time in over six months, Egyptian authorities closed Rafah crossing for all movements, reopening it fully again on 29 August. 
although movement and access into and out of Gaza should be further improved, no amount of humanitarian or economic support on its own will address the challenges facing Gaza. The current gradual approach is a holding operation and, and not a strategic way forward and a solution for the people of Gaza. Gaza requires political solutions that would see a fully lifting of Israeli closures in line with the UN Security Council Resolution 1860 and return of a legitimate Palestinian government to Gaza and the establishment of an independent sovereign Palestinian state on which Gaza is an integral part. I must also see Hamas and other armed groups stop the launching of incendiary devices, rockets and mortars, and end the military buildup. Mr. President, following the takeover of an UNWA school by Hamas, the agency reiterated in an 11 August statement that its installations are inviolable at all times. The agency protested the takeover and condemned the existence and potential use of structure, including tunnels under its premises, in the strongest possible terms. While the school was subsequently vacated by Hamas. Such actions undermine the inviolability and neutrality of UNWA premises and compromise the safe return of children to their schools on time. <coughs> UNWA and UNWA are working to remove any remaining unexploded ordinances as soon as possible. Mr. President, the state of Palestinian authorities finances remains precarious. While the monthly transfer of clearance revenue from Israel to PA occurs regularly, Israel continues to deduct an amount equivalent to what is calculated as paid by PA to families of prisoners and martyrs. These deductions, along with numerous other fiscal leakages, make increasingly difficult for the PA to recover its minimum expenditures including salaries to government employees and social protection payments to media households. <clears throat> I urge Israel and Palestinians to resolve the impasse of the prisoners' payment scheme and other fiscal leakages. And I call on donors to provide urgent financial support to the PA. On a positive note, on 29 July, the Israeli Minister of Health and Environment Protection met with their Palestinian counterparts for the first time in many years, amid an increase in engagement between Israel and Palestinian officials. On 29 August, yesterday, Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz met with Palestinian President Abbas in Ramallah, where they discussed security policy and economic issues among the aspects of the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. This was the highest level meeting between the two sides since the formation of the current Israeli government. <clears throat> I welcome this dialogue and I encourage more ministerial level engagement, particularly to advance for the financial and economic operation. I hope that such contact can result in bringing the parties in a position to advance unresolved issues, including political ones, and including those related to the implementation of agreements made by the parties. On the 27th of August, the Israeli Prime Minister Bennett met with, his, with US President Biden. The two sides exchanged views on the efforts to advance peace, security and prosperity for Israelis and Palestinians and reaffirmed the importance of Israel's historic partnership with Egypt and Jordan, as well as its expanding relation between Israel and the Arab neighbors. Mr. President, turning to the region, in Lebanon the government formation process has yet to yield tangible progress. The lifting of fuel subsidies on 11 August exacerbated fuel shortages, causing widespread disruption of service delivery. The situation in the Unifil areas of operation remain, remains tense following the launching of rockets from Lebanon towards Israel on 4 and 6 August. <clears throat> the latter instance 
claimed by Hezbollah. Israel responded on both occasions with artillery fire as well as airstrikes in southern Lebanon on the 5th of August. UNIFIL remains engaged with Lebanese armed forces and Israeli defense forces to defuse tension. On the Golan, the ceasefire between Israel and Syria has been generally maintained despite the continued volatile situation and violation of the 1974 disengagement of four agreement, uh, force agreement between the parties. On 17 August, Andov observed projectiles fired from west to northeast of their position, strike location and heavy explosions on the Bravo side. UNDOF continues to observe the presence of unauthorized military personnel and equipment in the area of separation. Finally, Mr. President, demonstrable, demonstrable changes is needed on the ground, especially for the people living in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza. I remain extremely concerned of the dire financial situation facing the Palestinian Authority and its ability to withstand the ongoing fiscal and health crisis. This may affect all Palestinians. It's critical that the PA will be empowered to exercise its responsibility through the occupied Palestinian territory, including on reconstruction into the Gaza Strip. The Ad Hoc Liaison Committee remains the established mechanism whereby the parties and donors can address relevant issues pertaining to economic situation of the PEA and PA institution building. The next meeting of the HLC can work out plans for how outstanding issues can be addressed by the parties with support from the donors and the UN. I also believe that no posit positive, hopeful steps should be wasted, and despite the formidable cha challenges, we should help provide momentum to this renewed engagement. Nevertheless, serious political efforts are required to return to meaningful negotiations that will address all final status issues and achieve a negotiated end to occupation and division of two states living side by side in peace and security based on the 67 borders in line with UN resolutions, international law and signed agreement. In the meantime, Mr. President, both sides should abide by the signed agreements and avoid unilateral actions that change the reality on ground and undermine the horizon towards a two-state solution. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank Mr. Wenslin for his briefing. I shall now make a statement in my